All right, guys, so this is a video that, or a topic that's kind of been hit by a few YouTubers. Initially, it was released by the good old Dutch Knife Bros, and it has been since talked to, or talked, at least Cedric Ada had talked about it. But today I kind of thought I would chime in because I feel like so many of these principles and so many of like what I've already talked about rolls super well into Five Knife Lies. And I thought that I had some interesting, at least interesting insight to throw into it. And feel free if you are a fellow YouTuber, because I know some, some of you guys watch my channel, definitely chime in and give me your thoughts on these five lies. But I thought I would start out with sharpness, but I thought I would at least jump in and start out with or go down the line that they did. So their lie, their first lie, was that sharpness is important. And I do largely agree with this one, and that's probably why I'm also starting with it. And that is that sharpness is essentially measured by the level of or how fine the edge is on a blade. So sharpness can be widely variable, um, but ultimately it is not as important um, or it is, I think, a pretty important factor. Of course, we do have sharpeners like myself. I have a wicked edge to keep my knives sharp, but there are some other factors that make blades better than other blades that are equally as sharp. So what I guess I'm trying to say here is that you can have two blades that are incredibly sharp, right? But if the blade grind and the blade thickness as a whole are not additionally thin, that you will suffer, of course. And I think this kind of just goes back to to, you know, simple um, principles of physics that, of course, the smaller or thinner something is, the less resistance it poses to passing through another object, right? The less molecules you have to pass through one or through an object, the easier or the less resistance you will have. So overall, that's the same kind of principle here. And I think some people, you know, think that by having something like a mirror polished edge, that suddenly they're going to have the best cutting experience. But if the grind and the thickness of the blade overall don't uh, match that mirror polished edge, it's not going to do a whole lot. Um, and so this is something that's worth noting and I think this is just generally a misconception when it comes to blades because there are some super, super sharp blades out there that really suck at cutting. And I think one of the best examples, in my opinion, is the good old Microtex. And that is because, once again, you have this reasonably short grind and a very, very small bevel. So while this is a very sharp knife, its actual cutting performance is probably not as good as you would expect. Anyways, let's jump to the next lie. And that is that military knives are the best. Now, this is one that I kind of feel mixed about because I do definitely agree when we're talking about strict like military issued slash military, like heavily used military knives, like types of brands or, you know, particular knives such as the Gerber strong arm, if you will, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best knife. Even if it's made in a place like the US, it's ultimately, you know, a lot of military mill spec or, you know, standard issued stuff is, it simply just means that it's the lowest bidder. Like the military, especially nowadays, isn't buying quality equipment. They're buying stuff that they can get a good deal on, right? So things like clothing, things like equipment aren't going to be the best military issued. Um, they're going to be functional and they're going to meet certain ramifications, but oftentimes it just means whoever can meet the requirements for the lowest price. Now, sometimes things like firearms have higher requirements, but even to an extent, you know, military standard issued, like let's just say the handgun, the Sig Sauer M17, M18, isn't necessarily the best handgun you can buy, right? It's just the one that the military chose because it passed all of its tests and was the lowest bidder. And that's truly what it was in the end. Things like the Glock 19X didn't win the contract because Glock had a certain price and that was the lowest they could go. So anyways, it just means military knives, strictly like military military issued and not most knives that most military people go for, so they go for because they are the lowest bidder. So this is something that is a very um, good case to make. And that doesn't mean that there aren't good military styled knives out there. Things like the Topps Ice Dagger is a really good military knife. Things like the Chris Reeve Knives Pacific, the Chris Reeve Knives Green Beret, the Spartan Knives, many of theirs. Um, 
that are designed by Bill Harzi. Excellent knives, right? Good steel, good blades overall, but those aren't really standard issued. You have to, if you are a military person, go out and buy them with your own money, just like myself. You know, you'd have to go out and buy it uh, with your own money. So yeah, military issued knives are not good. Um, and certainly, by and large, I think if you don't already know now, it just really means the lowest bidder. So the next one, at least I think the next one up was supposed to be that soft steel is bad. And this is one that I've talked about before on this channel, that soft steel, depending on your applications, and I think that the most important thing like when picking a knife, when using a knife, is ultimately what your intentions are for that knife. And the reason I have my Strider here out is that Strider is one of those knife makers that tends to run their knives at a softer heat treat. And the primary reason why that is, is that with softer heat treats, you tend to gain durability. And it's always a battle between, you know, durability, edge retention, toughness. These are all things that a steel, depending on its heat treat, will either gain or lose. So once again, something like S30V, if it's running a higher heat treat, so if it's a higher HRC, it'll have better edge retention, but the edge will be more brittle and more prone to chipping and breaking, right? So you have to factor in what your applications and intention for that knife is. And once again, that's good to know with things like 1095 or high, uh, different high carbon steels, especially things like 5160 and 1095, because you can run them reasonably low down at things like 56 HRC, and you can get a blade that you can literally bend 90 degrees over and it's not going to break. And in the field, you can bend it back to straight and still have a blade that is uh, something that can cut, right? And so you do lose edge retention, of course, by having that malleability, but at least you don't have a blade that will snap, right? So there's always a trade-off there. I think Cedric and Ada, um, or Pete, I should say, from Cedric and Ada, did a really good or brought up a really good point that ultimately I think it depends a lot on the steel. Once again, if you're going for something like OS 10, you know, you're not going to get um, super high performance by making this have a very hard heat treat. Same with things like S30V, right? Like this, you might get, you know, 50, 60 more cuts out of it before it's dull if you increase the HRC to something higher than say 58. But by and large, you're not really gonna gain a whole lot. Whereas something like Magna Cut, you really don't hit the peak performance of Magna Cut until you are running things like 62, 63, 64 HRC. That's where this steel really shines. And so it kind of goes back to application. If you want a slicer, Magna Cut and 63 HRC, good. If you want something that's going to be a little bit more durable, running something like 154 CM at 58 HRC is going to be good or running a differentially heat treated 1095, that's what you're going to want. So this is something that there's this notion that, you know, you just need a hard steel and say, sure, if you're going to do a lot of slicing and cutting, that's what you're going to want. But if you are going to be a little bit more abusive to your blade, you're going to want a softer steel, softer heat treat. All right. Next one up is that carbon steel is better than stainless. This one kind of surprised me that this was on here and maybe it's due to more of, and I personally think that this is more like wilderness because I don't think that there are practically anyone, any people out there that are in the EDC community to think that high carbon steel is better than stainless steel. And to be honest, things like alloys, like super steels are far past or far superior to either stainless or uh, high carbon steel as a whole. And what I mean by that is basically your knives that are things like powdered metals, um, these really high quality steels like Magna Cut, uh, Rex 45, S10V, 20CV. These are things that are leagues and miles ahead of your more traditional stainless steels like OS 10, OS 8, uh, 154CM, and then of course, moreover, your blades like 1095. Now I will say that I, I do always contend that one way that carbon steel is much better than their super steel and stainless steel brethren is in sheer durability. Like you're not going to find, even when it comes down to things like 3V, like 3V is probably the 
best contender because it is extremely tough, but things like 1095 and 5160 are still, as far as toughness goes, going to beat it more than likely. And that's predominantly because things like 1095 and 5160 are going to bend before they break. So in even talking about things like uh, S7, which is a tool steel, um, leans more towards high carbon. Those things are going to be extraordinarily shock resistant. I mean, S7 and 5160 are what they literally make leaf springs for truck and car suspension, primarily truck nowadays. But like when you think of trucks that haul heavy loads, they're using things like S7, 5160 um, spring steels to haul loads over thousands of miles. I mean, they're designed to take shock endlessly. So those steels are specifically designed for that. So obviously they're going to perform very well. They just so happen to be high carbon steels. So yeah, that's the one thing I will say that high carbon steel just from a logistics factor is better. But for most like sane humans, like normal people it, for EDC tasks, super steels and stainless steels do tend to make more sense. Um, yeah. So the next one is that Chinese knives are good. And I genuinely think that this is a lie. And I think that there's a way, like a lot of people are overlooking this fact and I get lots of comments about it myself. And you know, there's always people on both ends of the spectrum and don't get me wrong. I do have some Chinese knives, very few of them myself personally, but they, they're not all bad. Like they're not all horrible. And from an end user or consumer standpoint, you know, like so many people try to bring up like, oh, well, your phone is probably made in China. And like, yeah, a lot of things come from China. Don't get me wrong. You know, tons of things do. But at the same time too, when it comes to knives, it's like, you don't have to choose Chinese knives. There are plenty of really solid and even more affordably priced American made knives out there. I've even done a video on like affordable knife brands that are still you USA made. Um, so ultimately what I, I think it comes down to is the fact that, or the primary reasons why I dislike Chinese knives and why I don't think they're good is first off customer service. Like few people ever talk about this, but things like my hinder here, I've had missing pieces, sometimes screws back themselves out and fall out. And you know, you try to be vigilant, you try to put thread locker on things, but you know, you, no one's perfect, right? So, you know, you lose screws, you lose things every once in a while, and sometimes things break and you just just need replacements and I'm not necessarily talking about the blade as a whole sometimes you know little bits break and you just need replacement parts right well their customer service for logistically or pretty much all Chinese companies is going to be horrible and that's because one you're dealing with foreign people when you reach out to their customer service that don't like a lot can be lost in translations I'm not trying to say that they should understand American or English uh, as a language perfectly because that's just impossible but at the same time too it's like there is a lot that's lost in translations and also too because they are so far away like oftentimes when we're talking about one of these companies they're just a few states over right like we know that spider co is proudly made in colorado right they advertise it pretty much everywhere on their blade or at least the usa made spider co's right um so we know that you know they're not that far away if you need replacement screws replacement clips whatever you know you can reach out to them and they can send you something pretty easy pretty fast and there are other companies like essie where if you break their blades in any way doing whatever send it back and they send you a new one right and so the customer service of many american manufacturers even benchmade i will give them props to this is usually unrivaled by really any foreign country and especially China. So this is something that I think a lot of people forget is that it's nice to have really solid customer service that you can reach out to at any time. They're prompt, they know what you need, and you can get what you need from them to fix your knives. And oftentimes too, with American companies, it's free or very cheap to do this. So just putting that out there. All right, the other one that's worth mentioning is heat treats. Because there is really no set standard, in, in fairness, there's really no set standard for American knife makers either, but I think American knife makers tend to pride themselves more, so they tend to hold themselves more accountable. This isn't always the case, but they tend to hold themselves more accountable. So usually things like heat treat, quality control is really going to be top notch. Now, yes, in your higher OEMs in China, uh, knife companies like Wii, 
like Riate or Riot, however you'd like to say that, they do tend to hold better QC and better heat treats and such, but a lot of, there's a lot of questions there and Civivi and QSP and there's so many OEMs in China that it's hard for all of them to stay accountable, to stay truthful and to honestly bring you a quality product. I mean, I am heavily dubious when it comes to seeing, you know, like M390 blades that are coming out of China because it's like, you know, you need certain processes and certain machines to properly heat treat, properly machine these types of steels. And it is far easier to just laser etch M390. I mean, it literally costs nothing more to, you know, etch M390 into something as opposed to D2 or 154CM. And so while I'm not going to say that they're using poor quality steel, I would not be surprised if they're not actually using M390 but using something like S30V because the vast majority of people won't notice the difference between those two steels and they will perform similarly enough that they can pass it off and saying, oh yeah, we're using a great steel like S90 when they're really using S30. So anyways, I'm heavily dubious of uh, heat treats there as a whole, even if they are using the legitimate uh, steels in question like M390 or S90V or any other steels then lastly and just putting it out there is questionable labor practices now i don't want to get too preachy on this fact and you know usually i'm not a huge fan of you know regulations and work laws and stuff but as a whole you do have to admit that we really don't know the equitability of the workers making Chinese knives and at least you know that you know state per state there are certain rules regulating how workers are going to be treated how they're going to be paid how things are going to happen for them so you know when it comes down to it once again to think about supporting American workers American families and American values it's far better than to try to support whatever the hell China believes in which don't really know what that is so anyways that's my big thing you know from an objective standpoint of you know like oh quality materials you know actions designs it's like China does have a lot of promising things and honestly the biggest way that and I've said this in other videos that they are absolutely slaying and killing American knife manufacturers is their sheer willingness to work with American custom knife manufacturers out there and there's too many to mention but you know they take all of these people who are good designers and pay them for designs pay them royalties which is good in a certain sense and then make those designs right and so to an extent that's why Chinese knife manufacturers are able to bring us such good looking uh, you know, well-working knives, but at the same time, too, there is an undoubtable cost to that, which is really just, you know, the questionable labor practices that we don't really know, like, yeah, you're paying the, you know, let's just say Ray Laconico for his design, and that's cool and well and great, right? But, like, are the workers being treated like absolute trash? I mean, it's worth considering. And while once again, I'm not gonna sit here and try to argue everything because to an extent, you know, things like phones probably are made with child labor. And to an extent that's unavoidable, right? Uh, Apple, Samsung, many other OEMs for smartphones aren't going to suddenly move their manufacturing bases and all of the you know supply chains that they have to China. They're not just going to move those over to America. However, when it comes to knives, you do clearly have the option to choose, as I'm holding a Taiwanese knife actually, but you do have the choice to choose American-made knives and choose quality blades made in the States and support people who at least likely have common values, common beliefs, and are American once again. So anyways, you know, it is always a debatable thing. And I, I think there's like this push, especially by people who don't live in America to look at Americans and be like, oh, look at those wacky Americans with their weird beliefs. And, you know, they think that, uh, you know, they should support themselves. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's natural for most people who live in varying countries to have some degree of nationalism for whatever country, and, you know, want to believe and support that country's best interests. But anyways, guys, as always, God bless, and I'm out.